It's because, I suppose, I'm thought to be a bit of an explorer into crime. Sometimes people ask me, what's the grimmest crime you know? Grim, well, everyone's got his own idea of grimness. Depends on the kind of thing you personally can't take. If it's violence, physical violence to the living, then you'll say the grimmest cases are the sadistic ones. Neville Heath now, Jack the Ripper, the murder of Phyllis Dimmock in St. Paul's Road, Camden Town. If it's violence to the dead, if that affects you most, then you'll think the cases of dismemberment the worst. Ruxton, Mahan, Voisin and his slaughterhouse in Charlotte Street, Soho. But if you're like me and what really horrifies you, far more than blood and blows and mutilation, things that usually result from frenzy or from panic, if what really horrifies you is the presence of stark evil, not evil that flares up and then dies down again, but evil that is cold and constantly maintained. If that's what makes your flesh creep and sends shivers down your spine, there can be nothing grimmer than the story of the Stauntons. It's a story, I think, that ought to begin what may seem the wrong way round. Usually the key to a murder, the explanation of it, that's to be found in the character, in the nature of the murderer. But here it's to be found in the nature of the victim, in the mental makeup of poor Harriet Richardson, who happened to be one of the odd ones of this world. Odd how? The simplest thing to say about Harriet is she was a child, a grown woman physically, 33 years old at the time the story opens, but only a child in knowledge and capacity and temperament. Temperament, that's the most important point. It wasn't so much that she could barely write and that she couldn't spell. What mattered was she had a child's emotional reactions. You know how children, young children, you know how they are, madly stubborn about some things, utterly docile about others. There's nothing quite so docile as a child's docility, and there's nothing quite so stubborn as a child's stubbornness. All that applied to Harriet, and it was these childish qualities which made her vulnerable, and led her by way of dreadful sufferings to a dreadful end. Not an ugly girl by any means, Harriet Richardson, and always trim and well turned out. She'd excellent taste in clothes. Quite well born, decently brought up, and into the bargain she'd money of her own. Three thousand pounds or more. Nothing to sneeze at, even nowadays, and in the 1860s, when Harriet came of age. Three thousand pounds was a very tidy sum. But that undeveloped mind, reflected in her face and in her conversation, it seems to have frightened off any suitors that there might have been. And the years went by, and she was still a spinster, living with her widowed mother and visiting relatives. Would have gone on much the same, it's fair assumption, all her days. And they might well have been many, and they might well have been peaceful, if a certain Louis Staunton hadn't chanced to cross her path. Beyond saying he was a penniless clerk of twenty-three, and that Harriet's capital must have looked to him like untold gold, I don't think I shall even try to describe this Louis Staunton. I'll leave the picture of him to be painted by events. I might have had a shot at doing it, so to speak, in one, just by saying there's never been a bigger villain. But I've got to introduce his brother Patrick later on. With the three thousand pounds dangling there as bait, Louis went after Harriet right away. Don't suppose he then thought very far ahead. All he cared about was, by the law of those days, it's not so any more, but in those days, if there wasn't a settlement, a woman's property on marriage passed entirely to her husband. Let him only get his hands on that three thousand pounds. Then he could consider later what he'd better do with the half-witted woman that he'd got to marry for it.
Harriet, the silly childish Harriet, she was immensely flattered by the young man's attentions. When it came to a proposal, and in next to no time it did come to a proposal, she was transported into seventh heaven. Not so her mother. It wouldn't be true to say the old lady saw through Louis Staunton. If she'd really done that, she might have gone out of her mind. But she did at least size him up as a cheap adventurer. And she fought tooth and nail against the match, even petitioning the courts to intervene and make her daughter a ward in chancery as a lunatic. This desperate measure failed, and in the June of 1875, Harriet married Louis, giving her fortune and her life into his keeping. You shall presently see what he did with both. There's no doubt of this, he disposed of them exactly as he liked. Harriet put no obstruction in his way. Her childishly stubborn resistance to her mother was now equalled by her childish obedience to her husband. What Louis said went, and no argument. It would never have occurred to Harriet to disobey. Cut clean off from your family. Right. Forbid mother the house. Right. Leave me to pick the people you associate with. In a very short time, he had transformed Harriet's world. Her friends of a lifetime, and I mean friends, those friends faded out, and the remainder of the Staunton gang, they faded in. Here again, I think we'll skip the formal introductions. You'll get to know these charming people as we go along. There were three of them. Patrick Staunton, Louis's brother, who scraped some dingy sort of living as an artist. Elizabeth, his wife. And Elizabeth's sister, Alice Rhodes, rather a good-looking piece, aged about nineteen. She comes into the party through being Louis's mistress. Alice, in fact, was already enjoying this privilege during the spring of 1876 when Harriet gave birth to a boy. It was in all likelihood the arrival of the child that finally touched things off, that finally set Louis on his wicked course. You see, it crystallized his position. He'd got Harriet's money. He was sweet on Alice Rhodes. Harriet herself and now this confounded baby, they were a dead loss, simply trouble and expense. What could he do to shake them off? Vague plots and schemes floated through his mind. When they'd taken shape somewhat, he had a talk with Patrick. That summer, the summer that followed her confinement, the whole of Harriet's household in a London suburb was gradually moved to Patrick Staunton's cottage, a rather pokey cottage in a lonely part of Kent. The baby went in May. Elizabeth had undertaken to look after it. Harriet went in August. Louis had arranged to pay Patrick a pound a week for taking care of her. Louis went in November, but not actually to the cottage. He set up in a farm nearby with Alice Rhodes. The scene has been set. The actors have gathered. The drama of Harriet Staunton has begun. But at this crucial moment, the curtain falls. For six months, Harriet disappears from view, never seeing a soul outside the Staunton circle, never planting a foot outside the Staunton home. Not a sign, not the faintest trace of her existence. Even the tradesmen calling didn't know that she was there. What happened while the curtain remained down, that can only be deduced from what happened afterwards. When the curtain rises, or begins to rise again, the setting has been temporarily changed, and only two members of the cast are on the stage, Louis and Elizabeth, one day the following April, knocking on the door of an apartment house in Penge, a dozen miles or so away from where they live. Got any rooms to let, says Louis when the landlady appears. 
Bedroom and sitting room we want three weeks to a month. It's for an invalid lady, Elizabeth puts in. This invalid lady, Louis says, she lives out in the country. Doctor there doesn't understand her case. The landlady makes sympathetic sounds. They say the doctors here are good, that's why we're moving her. Suppose you couldn't recommend a name. Oh yes, the landlady could. Her own doctor, Dr. Longrig. So good to her little girl he was. And when she had had her right, they've got the name and address, and they've reserved the room, and there they are, round to Dr. Longrig's in two ticks. Feeble-minded and partly paralysed, is she? says the doctor. Who's been her medical attendant up to now? Louis glances at Elizabeth. Elizabeth at Louis. Dr. Creasy, Louis says at last. Dr. Creasy of Brasted, he's attended her. That is a plain lie. Neither Dr. Creasy nor any other doctor has attended the invalid lady who was partly paralysed. Very well, says Dr. Longrig. If you're bringing her up tonight, I'll call round in the morning. So it was all fixed, and the precious pair went scurrying off home. That evening, all four Stauntons combined strength. Just before dark it was, they waited until then, just before dark, they dragged from Patrick's cottage all that remained of the luckless Harriet. Half paralysed, half conscious, unable to speak or walk or stand, she was dragged from door to carriage, from carriage to train, from train again to carriage, and finally, finally up the steps of the apartment house in Penge. They didn't bother to bring any of her clothes. In the air of Penge, the Stauntons breathed more freely. They were in a different district. Doctors, coroners, police, they wouldn't know them. Harriet could get on with it. Harriet could die. Dr. Longrig had no doubt that she would die the moment he set eyes on her when he called next morning. It was so obvious, and such a hopeless case, the doctor was tempted into being rather casual. He noticed that his patient, now quite insensible, was extremely emaciated, exceptionally shrunken, but that didn't prompt him to a close examination. He could see all he wanted, tell all he needed, from the pulse, the breathing, and the eyes. I'm afraid she won't last out the day, he said, and went away. He was right enough. Harriet died within the hour. Dr. Longrig didn't come again, just sent a death certificate. Still in the same rather casual, careless style, put cerebral disease and apoplexy down as cause of death, relying much less on what he'd seen than on what he had been told. Everything had worked out precisely for the Stauntons. In the twinkling of an eye, they'd made arrangements for the funeral, they'd asked a nurse, meanwhile, to take charge of the corpse, and with all their business in Penge being concluded, they dashed off home again that very afternoon. It really looked as though they were going to get away with it. That they didn't entirely get away with it was due to one of those coincidences which seemed so far-fetched no one would ever dare use it in a novel. The husband of one of Harriet's sisters walked into a shop in Penge, heard someone say a lady had died nearby and mentioned where she'd come from, recalled that Harriet was thought to live down there, knew that her family feared she was being harshly used. So on a hunch he told the police. They got in touch with Dr. Longrig, and the body was inspected with greater thoroughness. Result, Dr. Longrig withdrew his death certificate. An inquest was opened, and post-mortem arranged. It must have been a grisly job conducting that post-mortem.
Dr. Longrig and his colleagues were shocked by what they found. There wasn't a single particle of fat upon the body, not a particle of fat in any of the organs. Her weight, and she was average height, her weight was five stone four. How come? What had reduced her to this pitiable state? Some form of poisoning? That was a possible explanation, but chemical analysis showed no poison present. In its absence, the doctors, there were three or four of them, the doctors came to a unanimous conclusion. They decided Harriet had died from prolonged starvation. The case became a nationwide sensation overnight, and as the surrounding circumstances were brought out at the inquest, how Harriet had been virtually imprisoned during life and forced across the countryside when on the point of death. The crowds collecting outside the coroner's court grew larger and more threatening with every daily session. The last straw, the finishing touch came when it was disclosed, that a day or so before that cruel trek to Penge, Patrick, telling some story he trumped up for the purpose, Patrick had left Harriet's baby at a London hospital where it died almost at once, died from sheer starvation. It was just as well for the Staunton Four that all of them were arrested. If they'd been turned loose, odds on they'd have been lynched. But was the public instinct right? Was the charge of murder against these people fully justified? Well, let's now put aside, let's forget about the women, Elizabeth Staunton, Alice Rhodes. There are some tricky legal points that bear upon their position. But the women are only minor puppets in the Staunton case. It's the men who count, and with them the matter's simple. The evidence was such, you can take my word for this, that if the jury found as fact that Harriet starved to death, they'd be bound to find that the Staunton brothers starved her. So the trial, as far as the two brothers were concerned, turned upon the question, what caused Harriet to die? If starvation, then the Stauntons had nothing left to hope for. It was the gist of their defence that she had died from something else. You might think that as all the doctors who had been at the post-mortem, they'd all come out strongly for starvation. You might think there wasn't much that the defence could do. But no, the defence carried several useful assets. First, there were two outstanding London specialists, far bigger shots than Dr. Longrig and his friends, who'd read reports of what had been observed at the post-mortem, and said that the doctors there misunderstood the signs. They didn't indicate starvation, but tuberculosis. Second, the post-mortem doctors, especially Dr. Longrig, were open to criticism of their methods and technique. Third, to make the best use of these advantages, Edward Clark was advocate for the defence. Never a more skilful cross-examiner of doctors, as you can judge for yourself as he gets up now at the Old Bailey, facing Dr. Longrig, who has just declared on oath that at the post-mortem he did observe tubercles on the brain, but those in his belief were not connected with the death. No, says Dr. Longrig, as soon as I knew there wasn't poison in the body, I at once made up my mind that death was owing to starvation. Clark starts in that low key which is his characteristic. When you gave your death certificate, he says, you had no reason, had you, to suppose anything wrong? No, 
says Dr. Longrig. You gave it in good faith. Yes. You had no idea at that time that there was starvation? No. The symptoms did not indicate starvation, did they? No. In a low key, yes. But after that short passage, you see, it shuts out all symptoms detected during life. Clark has got Longrig neatly tied to the post-mortem. The starvation theory has to stand or fall by that. Now he can exploit the chemical analysis, the one that was made because they wondered about poison. You thought at one time during the post-mortem, you thought at one time, didn't you, that poison caused the death? Dr. Longrig pouts his lips. I was suspicious of it. Suspicious? Really, did you not conclude that it was so? No. Wasn't that why the organs were sent to be analysed? Dr. Longrig, don't let's pretend, he is uncomfortable. We couldn't find, he says, enough disease to account for death. Clark faces the witness squarely. Will you undertake to say that the word starvation was as much as mentioned during the post-mortem? It was mentioned. By you? Yes, by me. In what context? I mentioned starvation as one of the causes of death. One of the causes? One of the possible causes. We all thought it was poisoning or starvation, and that analysis would determine which. Clark picks up a copy of the depositions, a record of what Dr. Longrig had said before the magistrates. Did you give evidence on this point at the police court? I believe I did. Do you remember what you said? Not exactly. Again, Dr. Longrig is a little disconcerted. I cannot recollect. If you said then that you had expected the analysis to show sufficient poison to cause death, would that be true? If I said it, it is true. Rather a curious answer, but it does establish this, that until the results of the analysis were known, Dr. Longrig had favoured the theory of poisoning as much, and probably more, than the theory of starvation. It's with rather a flourish Clark lays down the depositions. At the post-mortem, did you carefully inspect the stomach? Yes. And you have already told us all that you observed? Yes. As you said nothing to the contrary, we can take it that the stomach was of ordinary thickness. Oh no, oh no! Dr. Longrig jibs at this. Oh no, the coats of the stomach, they were thin. They were thin, were they? Tell me, how many times in the course of this case have you been examined? Two or three, says Dr. Longrig. Before the coroner? Yes. Before the magistrates? Yes. And here today before my lord? Yes. Until I put the question half a minute ago, have you ever, ever mentioned that the coats of the stomach were thin. There's not a sound in court as Dr. Longrig hesitates. No, he says at last, I don't think I have. Thinning of the coats of the stomach would be a strong sign of starvation. Yes, one of the most obvious signs. Yes. And you never mentioned it till now. It certainly confirms one's earlier impression that Dr. Longrig inclines to be slapdash. But he's going to be manoeuvred into deeper waters yet. You did observe the presence of tubercles on the brain. I did. Does that constitute the disease known as tubercular meningitis? Yes. A fatal disease. 
Yes. Dr. Longring knows where this is leading, to the alternative theory. Death due not to starvation, but to tubercular disease. He tries to stamp on it at once. Yes, but in this case, tubercular disease wasn't sufficiently advanced. Uh, there wasn't enough of it to produce the symptoms that I saw. Assume a more advanced condition of the disease. Is there any symptom in this case that it could not then have produced? Dr. Longrig doesn't answer. Seconds tick away. Any symptoms? Dr. Longrig takes a deep breath and he leaps. Rigidity of the muscles, he says. Do you say there is no rigidity of the muscles in death from tubercular disease? It's like the pounce of a tiger. Dr. Longrig is quite bowled over. Well, I've never seen it, he says. Do you say it can't exist? I can't say positively. And that is the only symptom that you can point out. Yes, but may I repeat, I am positive that the disease here wasn't far enough advanced. The amount of tubercle was very, very slight. Did you examine the brain with the microscope? Clark asks. No. Would you agree that the microscope is a great help in diagnosis? Oh, yes. There can't be any quibbling over that. Oh, yes, but you could see the amount quite well with the naked eye. Can you speak as positively as you could have done had you used the microscope? The question is such there can only be one reply. Well, no, says Dr. Longrig. You can see more with the microscope than with the naked eye. Well, yes, says Dr. Longrig. So what the microscope would have shown you, you, in fact, did not see. Well, no, says Dr. Longrig. No doubt of it, it was a masterly cross-examination. It exposed every possible weakness to the full, and it smoothed the way for Clark's two eminent medicos who said that, although of course they didn't see the corpse themselves, they could tell at once from reading what the others said they'd seen, that Harriet had died from tubercular disease. But despite their eminence, and despite Clark's eloquence, despite all that, the defence did not persuade the court their way. The judge was unimpressed by these second-hand deductions, said it was a most unsatisfactory form of evidence, made no bones about it in his summing up that it ought to be accepted that Harriet's death was from starvation. The jury, for their part, were clearly nothing loath, for they proceeded to convict all four prisoners of murder, and the women shouldn't have been convicted on the capital charge. But there it was, and the whole bunch were sentenced to be hanged. That isn't quite the end, though, of the Staunton case. While the public gave unqualified approval to the verdict, certainly the verdict against the Staunton men, the leaders of the medical profession sprang to arms. Two of their most distinguished members had been disregarded, scorned and rejected by the jury and the judge. What could these laymen know of scientific matters, of the symptoms of meningitis or starvation? How, for that matter, could the ordinary GPs who had conducted the post-mortem? How could they challenge those of senior specialist rank? The case must be reopened. Pressure must be brought to bear upon the authorities. So some 700 doctors, with no other than the great Sir William Jenner at their head, they signed a statement recording their opinion that the defence doctors were right about the way that Harriet had died. A Home Secretary can and he should resist any uninstructed pressure, but pressure like this, from the pundits on the subject, 
What can a conscientious minister do? He can't say, can he, that there isn't a grave doubt? And so the medical big shots had their way, and the Staunton men, as well as the Staunton women, were reprieved. Well, there you are. Everything's fine, isn't it? The experts, the professionals, step in to save the day to save two men from going to the gallows for the crime of starving to death a woman who didn't die of starvation. But wait a minute, that still isn't quite the end of the Staunton case. One thing is certain, the science of morbid anatomy on which all this depends, it was in its infancy at the time of the Staunton trial. Students today know more about it than specialists did then, and a man like Bernard Spilsbury, his opinion on the case would outweigh theirs completely. And we've got his opinion. We know what Spilsbury, the great pathologist, thought about this case. He had studied it closely, and one day in 1921 he read a paper summarizing the fruits of his research. The findings of the post-mortem, he told the Medico-Legal Society, a society he treat with as much respect as any court, the findings were overwhelming in favour of starvation being the cause of Harriet Staunton's death. So the jury and the judge and the little local doctors, those amateurs of science, they had hit it after all. Harriet was starved to death. Is there any doubt by whom? The fact that they escaped the scaffold that they so deserved, it not only travesties the tribunals of justice, it's worse, because it makes one hanker after something else. For although one knows that lynch law is always wrong in principle, and almost always horribly unjust in actual practice. There have been moments when I found it possible to wish that the Staunton brothers had been left to the mercy of the mob. <laughs>